Dr. Cindy Lin is a clinical associate professor of sports and spine medicine in the Department of Rehab Medicine at the University of Washington. She also serves as the associate director of clinical innovation for the Sports Institute at UW Medicine. Additionally, she is an associate editor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Journal and a member of the Exercise Medicine Clinical Practice Committee for the American College of Sports Medicine. Her clinical practice is the UW Eastside Specialty Center as well as the Husky Stadium Sports Medicine Center. Her clinical interests include the care of sports, spine, and musculoskeletal injuries. And her research interests include exercise as medicine, med tech innovations, sports injury prevention, motion and gait analysis, and women and youth sports medicine. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Cindy Lin as she presents her talk, Physical Activity Challenges and Solutions During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Thanks, Dr. Thanks. Lin. Thanks so much, Charles, for the kind introduction. And um, so as you mentioned today, I'm going to be talking about a very timely topic that all of us care about, I think, in sports medicine, rehabilitation medicine, and personally, which is how do we stay active and what's the evidence about activity during a pandemic? I have no financial disclosures. So in terms of what I'm going to be covering this morning, so I'm going to talk about where we start, where we started even before this pandemic, which is about the global burden and epidemiology of physical inactivity. Um, I'm going to talk about what happens when our baseline physical inactivity crisis meets this COVID pandemic. I'm going to share some lessons. Um, you know, most of us on this call are clinicians, healthcare providers in some capacity. How can we start having this dialogue about our patients now if we aren't already about physical activity and the importance um, for their health? And we're gonna talk about a lot of different kinds of unique physical activity solutions and opportunities because there's definitely no one size fits all solution. So the WHO has called physical inactivity an urgent public health priority. Um, and this is already many years ago. Um, it's been called the fourth leading risk factor for death worldwide, ranking right up there along with high blood pressure, tobacco use, high blood glucose. And in 2012, there was a Lancet article that actually talked about, you, you, know, you may not have thought pandemic, but it, uh, how physical inactivity is a pandemic. One in 10 deaths worldwide is attributable to physical inactivity. And that if people who have, so basically in 2008, over 5 million deaths globally from non-communicable diseases, meaning heart disease, diabetes, um, could have been prevented if people who were physically inactive were sufficiently active. So you can really see the power globally of the importance of keeping populations active. So looking at some specific diseases, if people were active, we could prevent 6% of deaths due to heart disease, 7% of deaths due to diabetes, and 10% of deaths due to colon cancer and breast cancer. Physical inactivity has come and will continue to come at tremendous economic costs to our healthcare systems worldwide. Um, it costs healthcare systems worldwide about $53 billion. This is back in 2013. And deaths attributable to physical inactivity also affect productivity losses and disability adjusted life years. In the United States alone, insufficient physical activity accounts for over 11% of healthcare expenditures. And furthermore, in the United States, physical inactivity has been called a top health risk expected to drive future health insurance claims. So right up there, along with everything we traditionally manage in our healthcare system, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, we really need to start looking at physical inactivity um, as part of population health management. So in 2018, there was an update of the US physical activity guidelines. And it basically recommended about 150 minutes a week at least of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous aerobic activity. Um, muscle strengthening on at least two days a week. And in terms of the guidelines, 
it has really shifted to be more inclusive to smaller amounts of activity. So the general messaging is move more, sit less, and that some activity is better than none. <coughs> so as we stand prior to COVID, approximately 80% of adults in the United States do not meet these US guidelines for aerobic and strengthening activities. And you can see that there are also significant geographic variations in this. Looking to our own community where we live in Seattle, in King County, similarly, about 80% of adults do not meet the US physical activity guidelines for aerobic and strengthening activities. And there are variations by zip code um, and racial ethnic backgrounds. So we're really looking at determinants of health, social determinants of health, and how there's an interplay um, with that. And it's also been well known that lower socioeconomic status is also associated with higher rates of physical inactivity with those with annual income um, less than $25,000 a year, almost 40% are inactive compared to individuals um, with income over 75,000 a year, about 12% are inactive. And so how does this start to meet with a lot of the risk factors and epidemiology that we're seeing now in the COVID pandemic? So the prevalence of self-reported physical inactivity is 40% higher in those with greater than one chronic medical condition. Um, and we also see that, as I mentioned on the prior slide, that physical inactivity is associated with other demographics, um, which include higher BMI, lower education level, increased age. And there are also um, is a greater prevalence of physical inactivity reported in among women than in men, among Hispanics, um, Blacks, Af um, Alaskan, sorry, American Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Caucasians. So before I get too far into, because I'm going to be talking a lot about physical inactivity, exercise, and sedentary behavior, I just wanted to briefly define these words. Um, so physical activity is a broader term. It's defined as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. Whereas exercise is thought of as a subset of physical activity, it's planned, it's intentional, purposeful in the sense that it's intended to maintain physical fitness as one of its objectives. And sedentary behavior is energy expenditure less than 1.5 mets while in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture. And so you could see with these definitions, somebody could actually be very physically active, um, yet also sedentary at the same time. So, so they're not two conflicting categories. So for instance, you know, I say a typical patient I could see could be somebody who sits in their office chair for about eight plus hours a day working, and then yet they go for a 30 minute run in the evening. Um, and they're like, well, I'm really active because I run every night, but actually they're quite sedentary as well as being physically active because they're sitting most of their day. Dr. Lin, yes. uh, the question in terms of the definition of METs on that previous slide. Yeah, me metabolic equivalence. So it's like an energy expenditure metric. Sorry, I'll try to define all the terms for the residents and med students on the call. So it's, yeah, it's like a metric of metabolic equivalence or energy expenditure. Um, so in terms of prolonged sedentary behavior, negative effects. Um, so on average, the American adult spends about six to eight hours a day sitting. And sitting for greater than six hours a day is, is associated with 19% higher mortality rate from all causes compared to sitting for less than three hours a day. So it's really important to try to decrease our sedentary time. Um, there's been some studies trying to look at, well, how much activity do you need to do to offset the negative effects of prolonged sitting? And um, there was one study that found that, um, well, actually there's several studies, but I think they summarized it as if you do a high level of moderate intensity, which means breathing harder than normal activity, um, 60 to 75 minutes a day, that can offset the increased risk of death associated with high sedentary time of over six hours a day. 
However, in studies when they've looked at people who sit for over three hours a day, that is associated with increased mortality regardless of additional physical activity. So there seems to be something about television viewing, you know, and they postulate, you know, maybe there's other health behaviors like snacking and other things um, that are additive when it's associated specifically with TV viewing. So I just sort of laid the groundwork for where we are in terms of the physical inactivity crisis. So what happens when physical activity crisis meets the COVID-19 pandemic? So this is the latest statistics as of yesterday evening. Um, globally, more than 4.16 million cases of COVID have been seen worldwide with over 285,000 deaths. And um, in the United States alone, um, there's been over 1.3 million cases with probably over 80,000 deaths. And you can also see that there's significant geographic variations in that. And um, one of the questions is, well, what do we know about physical activity patterns since the COVID-19 pandemic began and the new normal in a lot of places around the globe? became shelter in place, orders, and um, social distancing. So Google has provided some helpful mobility reports um, using um, basically, you know, people who disclose their location data, um, and they can aggregate this data. And what they found is that you know, um, for parks, which gives us some idea of public places that people spend, a decrease in 11% of activity there, transit stations, so public transportation, which is a source of physical activity um, for people, was down by about 48%, and residential um, activity was increased by about 11%. And this was compared to a baseline back in January through early February. There was a Gallup poll that was performed in the end of March, and it found that most Americans reported that they did not change or they actually decreased their exercise patterns. Um, so you can see in this chart here, you know, during coronavirus situation, how have each of you changed? So on average, um, you know, 14% say that they increased their activity, but overall about 50% didn't change it and 38% said that their activity actually worsened during that time. There was another survey done in the UK um, that polled about 2,000 adults in the UK and they were much more inclusive about the definition of activity um, and what they, because they included, you know, doing house chores or walking. And they found about a 25% decrease in physical activity. Um, you know, from about two hours a day, again, inclusive of house chores and those sorts of things, to um, one and a half hours a day. Um, it seemed like, you know, 68% six, of people were concerned about the effects of no exercise on their health. There were decreases in average daily step count, and that about four in 10 wanted to do more activity during this pandemic, but they just aren't really sure how to do that. Um, this is another study looking more specifically at active persons. So Run Repeat, which is they sell shoes and running, running supplies. Um, they just did an online survey of their web traffic. So again, knowing that those are people who are looking for running shoes. Um, and what they found out of this subgroup is that people who normally run about one to two times a week reported increasing their exercise 88%. People who ran, um, you know, what they consider a moderate amount, three times per week, increased their exercise by 38%. And people who normally run over four times a week actually decreased their exercise by 14%. So we can see that this, all of these show that we may be having some um, impacts on activity in our communities. So in terms of the youth data, um, I haven't seen any published study yet um, looking at activity rate changes in youth during COVID-19, but prior studies have shown that children tend to gain weight when school is out during the summer months, and that effect is more pronounced in Hispanic and American 
um, African American youth um, and in children who were overweight at baseline. Um, I think that this effect may be even more accentuated in that right now there's additional risk factors that aren't happening in the summer months, which includes um, a significant increase in screen-based remote learning, um, food insecurity, households are stocking up on um, processed high caloric intake foods, um, playgrounds are closed and in many communities, depending on where you live, sports teams and activities are closed, and they're facing significant um, family and financial stressors due to the high and increasing unemployment rate. So there is an um, ongoing global survey um, of physical activity levels and exercise behaviors, um, which is a collaboration between um, several countries and it's actually still available online. They are recruiting for a second phase of the study where they're going to be providing digital and um, online exercise videos for people in different countries and languages. So I encourage you to participate the, in this. So this study was, um, or this is more of an editorial or opinion piece, was published in Progress in Cardiovascular um, Diseases, and it talks about a tale of two pandemics. So how will COVID-19 pandemic and physical inactivity affect one another? And our concern um, for those of us who work in physical activity research is that now we have many populations worldwide, um, you know, at baseline, we know, for instance, that 80% of Americans aren't meeting the US physical activity guidelines. And now we're going to have an increase in the number of individuals who are becoming physically inactive, um, having deconditioning, um, and that they may have increased effects of their underlying chronic diseases, and this can have a dramatic impact on our healthcare system and population health. We do know that currently um, having chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease um, is seen more commonly in adults who are requiring hospitalization for COVID. And um, this article I just mentioned, Tale of Two Pandemics, says that because people with COVID-19 are more likely to be hospitalized and have poor health outcomes if they have these chronic medical conditions, if we can do something to decrease um, um, the prevalence and severity of chronic medical conditions um, via promoting healthier lifestyles, including physical activity, of course, nutrition, um, other factors um, that we can actually decrease the mortality and morbidity associated with pandemics. So it's more important than ever that we start really looking at this and for those of us who practice in this field to really find ways of making an impact now. So in terms of um, the actual prevention of upper respiratory tract infections, one of the questions you may ask is, does exercise actually enhance your immune response in any way and can help reduce our risk of um, contracting COVID? And while we don't have COVID specific data on that, we can draw from what's already in the literature that's been done in the past. So there's this whole field called exercise immunology and um, you know, based on studies, it's believed that regular physical activity and frequent exercise actually enhance immunocompetency, enhance immunoregulation over the lifespan. And that's through augmented immunosurveillance against both pathogens and cancer cells and by reducing systemic inflammation. And um, this, this study is a good read um, by David Neiman who, um, back in 1989, this, this is actually the original graph from a Neiman study where he looked at marathon runners and was one of those in the field to basically describe this J-shaped relationship between exercise and the risk of upper respiratory tract infections um, and finding that moderate intensity exercise um, actually decreases the risk of upper respiratory tract infection incidence and duration by 40 to 50 percent. 
So you can see, of course, it's a J-shaped curve. And um, at one end of the spectrum, there's heavy exertion. And some studies have found that that may be associated with an increased risk of upper respiratory tract infection. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, and that so-called increased risk has been called the open window. So the open window hypothesis is that, um, you know, I wouldn't even say hypothesis, but it's um, already out there in the literature that immune system is compromised in the hours after vigorous exercise, and that that can increase lead to an increased risk of opportunistic infections in the days after. And this is based on several studies that have found that athletes participating in marathons, ultra marathon races, and sort of comparing um, ones who were running shorter distance, long distances against control runners who did not participate in the race um, had a higher incidence of URTIs. However, there are some more recent studies that have called this into question, you know, does this really apply to the general population of non-runners? Um, you know, generally I'd say a lot of the advice um, going around right now is to caution people against high intensity or very vigorous exercise, unless you're a trained athlete and you're already doing that regularly. Um, you know, but um, a good study to read on that is by Campbell and Turner, which I cited at the bottom of this, which is debunking the myth of exercise-induced immune suppression. And basically their review postulates that um, there's not actually a decrease in immune function, but it's just a shift of the blood, um, you know, the lymphocytes and the other cytokines to more peripheral surveillance instead of blood-based surveillance that in some way they're saying, well, maybe that actually increases your body's immune defense. It's just that we're not detecting it in the right ways through the animal studies and the human studies that have been done. So I'd say basically the take home message is that there's still a question mark over um, the effects of intense exercise and um, immune susceptibility and that extrapolating from the athlete studies, which, you know, they may be exposed to other factors such as being in a math mass participation event, travel sleep disruption need to be factored in as well when generalizing to um, the lay population of non-athletes. So um, looking at some other studies of whether exercise, so let's, let's look at something more flu specific because I think um, it, it's a little bit more helpful and gives us some more analogies to our current situation. So is exercise protective against um, influenza associated mortality. And this was a study done in Hong Kong, which was a retrospective. So they looked at over 24,000 adults who died in the 1998 Hong Kong influenza outbreak. And um, basically what they did was that they surveyed a relative um, of, the, of the deceased um, person and asked them, well, how much did they exercise? And what they found is that those who exercise in this very broad category, I mean, they said mild exercise one time a month to moderate exercise three times a week was associated with a lower odds ratio of influenza associated mortality compared to those who exercise basically none at all or minimal, which is less than one time a month. So it seems that mild to moderate exercise, um, regular exercise seems to decrease influenza associated mortality. Um, for those who exercise over four, sorry, that should say four times a week, not four times a month, had actually a similar odds ratio and excess mort risk of mortality as those who exercise less than one month, one time a month. So meaning that they didn't see any significant beneficial effect of exercising more than four times a week. Again, that's a correction on the slide. Um, they called it a U-shaped dose response pattern. I'm not really sure of its U-shape based on their data, but there were significant limitations based on their study design, which is that it relied on the recall of the relative. And they actually, in the details of the study, were not asking for the person's physical activity level prior to just um, their um, passing away from the flu, but actually trying to get a baseline of their lifestyle habits 10 years before their flu-related death. 
So there's a lot of unanswered questions about the impact of physical activity on COVID related complications. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and concern about the hypercoagulable state that's been seen in COVID cases, um, including in younger adults that's been associated with venous and arterial thrombotic complications. Um, there are some studies, again, prior to COVID that did find a very weak association between venous thromboembolism and prolonged work or computer-related seated mobility um, with, with um, increasing mean hours of seated time associated with higher risks of um, venous thromboembolism. And um, there is some concern if patients with COVID are quarantining at home, particularly if they're on bed rest and decreasing their mobility drastically, you know, could this be a mediator of thrombotic complications, development of pneumonia, ARDS, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I think this is an area that needs further investigation, but um, that it seems advisable that if people are able to still move around their homes as best they can, um, even if they have COVID, um, you know, without exacerbating their shortness of breath or respiratory complications, that it's probably it's still important for them to be still moving. Um, another area of significant concern is the mental health toll of the pandemic. Um, and a survey by the American Psychiatric Association found that one in three adults say that COVID is actually having a significant impact on their mental health. And there's a lot of concerns um, that it's going to have a negative impact on their finances and fear about um, running out of food and being able to afford basic supplies. And um, Exercise, um, albeit it's not the major solution or in any way the only solution, but I think that it is important to remember that exercise can be um, as effective um, as some antidepressants in reducing the symptoms of mild to moderate depression. Um, it's typically described in the psychiatry literature as an adjunct treatment to antidepressant and psychotherapy, which is the mainstay of treatment. Um, but it's also important to remember that antidepressants, um, some of them can have common side effects, whereas exercise does not have those side effects. So it's really important for us to be talking about ways of incorporating movement during the day. In terms of reducing anxiety symptoms, regular aerobic exercise has been shown um, that it decreases reactivity of the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in anxiety symptoms. And so um, again, it's another way that we can help support um, movement in people who are um, facing um, these symptoms during this pandemic. So there's really a lot of, and I tried to summarize what's already out there in the literature, um, but there's a lot of unanswered questions. So looking at clinicaltrials.gov for COVID, um, you know, there's over 1,300 studies that have been posted on there globally related to COVID. And out of those, about 39 studies actually also involve the use of the terms physical activity, exercise, or telerehabilitation. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think some of the people on the call today are probably hopefully involved in or are going to help answer some of these questions too that we, we don't really know. So it's like, how does exercise interact with your acute risk of COVID infection? How does one's baseline cardiorespiratory fitness impact their prognosis? Um, how does exercise affect a vaccine response? So there are some studies um, related to influenza vaccine in older people that have found that if they exercise after getting their flu vaccine, it actually improves their antibody um, production. So it's really important that if there is a beneficial effect of exercise that we're looking at that and that we're um, making appropriate recommendations. There are um, some medication and gene therapy targets that are being researched currently that basically mimic the effects of exercise. So an example of that would be extracellular superoxide dismutase, which is a free radical scavenger that's produced by skeletal muscles um, that in animal studies has actually been really shown to improve recovery from ARDS, so acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, which is a major cause of mortality um, in ICU patients with COVID. Um, and so 
you know, clearly for that population of patients that there's going, there's a need for medication and gene therapy targets um, for these kinds of medications. But for those who can stay physically active, this is something that your body produces through exercise. So with that being said, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about flattening the curves. Right now we're pretty much still somewhere first wave um, to second wave with the immediate mortality, morbidity of COVID and the impact of resource restrictions. And there's um, a lot of concern that we're gonna have these sort of following waves, which are going to result from basically chronic medical conditions that had interrupted care due to COVID and um, the mental health impacts, the trauma, um, economic um, stressors um, related to the COVID pandemic as well. And this is a good article that was published in BMJ. Um, again, another opinion piece um, by Julie Silver, who's at Spalding Rehabilitation, who talks about how it is time for us to use prehabilitation. So what is prehabilitation? Well, prehabilitation is basically an intervention um, or therapy or exercise that's aimed at improving a patient's health before an, an anticipated upcoming physiological stressor. So in this case, meaning the pandemic and it's so important um, for us to get strong and get physically active as a population and encourage that in our patients so in the event that they were to um, contract COVID that they are able to fight this off the best that they can and studies have shown that persons who have medical comorbidities, the elderly, those who are medically frail, actually stand to gain the most by doing any activity that could help increase their functional reserve to withstand a stressor, you know, whether it's an infectious illness or if they're going into a surgery. That's the concept of prehabilitation. So what can we do um, in our clinical practice now to help address this? So um, let's talk a little bit about exercise as medicine. So exercise as medicine is a global initiative of the American College of Sports Medicine. And um, the framework that they promote for healthcare providers is these three simple steps, which is number one, ask, um, your patients about physical activity, right? So we can't start talking and counseling patients about activity if we don't know what they're doing now. So we have to start by asking, where are you now? What are you doing to be active now? Um, that's followed by exercise counseling and prescription. Um, you know, so tailoring something based on their activity level. And then lastly, providing them with activity resources. So that means, um, you know, referring them to appropriate ACSM or EIM, sorry, exercise medicine, um, credential fitness professional, or um, referring them to community or home-based resources that are going to be appropriate. And physical activity, um, I strongly believe, should be a vital sign. And um, other um, professional organizations, including American Heart Association, has talked about this because um, cardiorespiratory fitness is a very strong predictor of early death. Um, it's as important, if not more important, than many of the things that we assess regularly, such as um, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. So in terms of the exercise vital sign, and we have done this here at University of Washington in certain pilot clinics, um, it asks how many days a week do you engage in moderate to strenuous exercise, meaning just anything in which they're breathing harder than normal, and then on average, how many minutes a week do you engage in exercise at this level? So you can see this is a screenshot of what it looks like in our EPIC electronic health record. This is something that the medical assistants are helping to collect in our clinic. Even my medical assistant now when we're doing telehealth rehabilitation is asking this vital sign um, when she's calling patients at home prior to doing our Zoom visit. And it just gives us a general sense of how active a person is at baseline. And they can do this while um, doing the blood pressure and heart rate in the clinic visit. These are some of the clinics where we have this physical activity vital sign at UW Medicine. This is an exercise vital sign cart in a primary care clinic at Northgate. 
where, again, they're asking the exercise vital sign for every patient, every visit as part of their intake vitals. So based on our research here, that we've been involved in over several years, um, over 117,000 patients at UW Medicine have had an exercise vital sign recorded at one of the primary care clinics um, under the leadership of Dr. Nicole Gentile and um, Justin Kappel. Um, they have um, led a project where over 48,000 patient visits have an exercise vital sign, and they found that this is all prior to COVID, approximately one fourth of primary, patients, um, primary care patients report zero minutes of exercise per week. We've started to look at some of the population health data with, <coughs> with finance and population health analytics here. And we found that patients who exercise less generally have a higher disease burden, um, meaning that they have more chronic medical conditions. They tend to utilize within our healthcare system more emergency room visits, inpatient hospitalizations, and primary care visits. Um, this is some of the work of Dr. Mark Cederberg at the Harborview Amputee Clinic, in which um, 229 patients with limb amputation were asked about a self-reported exercise vital sign, and about 28% um, reported exercising over 150 minutes a week. And we also found that <clears throat> some um, factors that seem to be associated with more exercise, um, including that having a functioning prosthesis, um, females reported exercising less than males, and there was a um, small, so weak um, effect of increasing age, Charles, Charleston comorbidity index, which is um, their chronic disease burden, and BMI on lower um, exercise vital sign. It was small, but statistically significant correlation. So this just, um, again, showcases some of the work that we've done locally to really understand, you know, how physically active are different populations of patients in primary care, um, patients um, with physical disabilities. And some of the most commonly cited barriers to physical activity, which um, I think apply to ourselves, I, I can think of it myself too. Um, so many studies have identified lack of time, um, presence of caregiving duties, lack of motivation, lack of energy, and these are all the barriers to physical activity. So what can we do in the healthcare setting to help address that? So through the Exercise is Medicine Initiative, they recommend a fit um, prescription framework. So think about it this way. So the same way that you're prescribing an antibiotic for a patient that has a, um, you know, infection, you would want to tell them the frequency, the intensity, meaning the dose, um, the type that they should be doing, and the time. So for instance, this could be what I wrote here, a simple prescription for somebody who is not active um, with diabetes, insulin dependent, could be something like three times a week after every meal, so meaning after lunch and dinner, do a brisk walk for 15 minutes um, while you're breathing harder than normal. That would be an example of a simple exercise prescription. Um, I'm also quite a fan of this um, Choose to Move prescription, which is in this article, which I highly recommend, which is called Selling Exercise, so your patients want to buy it. And Michelle Cigar, she's a um, PhD in behavioral science, and she says that what we're, you know, doing wrong is that when we try to behavior change in patients, you know, whether it's exercise or quitting smoking or alcohol use, is that we're looking at it from our perspective, which is factors that we care about, like saying, well, it's going to improve your health. It's going to improve your hemoglobin A1C. But actually, patients don't really care about that so much because it doesn't um, relate to their daily needs and goals and how they're basically just trying to survive every day and get through their day with their work and balancing childcare. And that to really help improve behavior change, um, around physical activity, they have to choose to move, meaning that um, you have to identify it or they have to identify it with a positive experience that they get out of being physically active. So I'm a huge fan of this. This is a printed prescription where they can actually check off, well, what are the reasons why they want to be act active? You know, is it 
to decrease anxiety? Is it to clear their mind? What are the movements that are gonna bring you these experiences? Um, and then what's a goal for starting this week, right? So just helping them to get started this week right away. Um, and so let's move on to um, physical activity solutions and opportunities, right? So we talked about prescribing but how do we connect people with the resources to be active given the current circumstances and the limitations of social distancing and shelter in place? And I really think about physical activity solutions um, as just having more tools in your toolbox, right? There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all exercise prescription for everybody. And so the more um, different ideas you have for patients, the more apt you are to find something that's going to work and help them um, figure out something that they will actually enjoy and stick to. Another really great resource for patients is on the Exercises Medicine website because they have an updated handout that you can give to patients about staying active during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in addition to giving suggestions on types of appropriate activity and talking about safety of going to public gyms, it also answers some um, common questions, which is, should I limit my activity if I I'm just under quarantine, but I don't have confirmed COVID. And then the answer is no, you should you know, be as active as possible. Um, if you have confirmed coronavirus infection and you're under quarantine, um, if you're asymptomatic, you can um, continue up to moderate intensity activity, but using symptom as a guide, but for individuals with any symptoms, whether it's fever, cough, shortness of breath, they should be consulting their physician for any activity beyond low intensity. Um, an, another tool and resource for patients that can be helpful is the Exercise Rx website, which we developed through the Sports Institute. It's an online search tool for the greater Seattle area that provides free and low-cost exercise options, um, including ones that are community-based. It has over 600 resources spanning 104 zip codes, and um, this is also open to um, additional resources, so meaning if you have additional resources, definitely contact us, and we can add that to the website site. Um, particularly relevant for now is our Exercise Anywhere resource. So we have on the Exercise Rx website as well some home exercise examples um, as well as we've compiled um, resources that are free for patients um, currently during the COVID pandemic. So that includes the YMCA, Peloton has um, free classes that you can try. My kids are a huge fan of Go Noodle, um, which is um, like sort of like online dance videos um, that they can do from home. Um, and the Daily Mile, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is a program in the schools, um, typically where kids break for 15 minutes to run or jog at their own pace. Um, but now we can do Daily Mile at home too. And um, it's important to remember that, um, you know, exercise doesn't have to be some huge undertaking where you set aside 30 minutes to an hour. Um, there is some recent increasing research that even taking short breaks for activity, what we call now fitness snacks or high intensity incidental physical activity is better than doing no activity at all. So that would mean, you know, short bursts of activity, meaning run up the stairs instead of just walking up the stairs, doing things like carrying groceries, uh, mopping the house, yard work, um, that, that these are beneficial as well. So home exercises, try to play part of this video too. Um, this is a great um, book by Joel Press. Um, at Hospital for Special Surgery, and he's going to, um, you know, demonstrate in this video how you can even exercise um, while watching TV. So he's demoing how, you know, between watching commercials and flipping channels to move side to side on the couch, you know, try to change channels with your arms raised in the air. And so there's ways that people can be creative, um, do body weight exercises from home, use water bottles, cans of food for resistance if they ha don't have um, hand weights at home. It just takes a bit of being creative. Um, in addition to home exercises, certainly walking outdoors for people who live in communities where they can social distance and that it's safe to walk is an important way that people are becoming active currently. So um, how many steps a day? Um, so in terms of 
where this whole 10,000 steps a day came from. It came from a Japanese company in 1965, which sold this device called 10,000 steps a day. So it really didn't really start with a specific scientific basis. It was more of a marketing scheme by a company that was selling a pedometer. Um, studies have found that if you take 8,000 steps a day, that's associated with lower all-cause mortality than taking 4,000 steps a day. And for elderly women, um, mean age of 72 years, even taking 4,000 steps a day is going to be better than taking 2,000 steps per day. So as I mentioned the Daily Mile, previously um, Daily Mile at home is basically just taking a 15 minute break, walking, jogging around the neighborhood for the whole family to stay active during this time. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the studies um, that a lot of people probably heard about in the news, um, which um, is about, well, how about running or cycling outdoors? Um, and so there was this study done in, I think it was in Netherlands, um, that looked at airflow and aerodynamic movement of droplets related to human um, movement. And they use a wind tunnel simulator and use a particle generator um, and simulated walking, running, and cycling. And what they conclude is avoid the slipstream. And what they mean by that is basically this image here on the side in B, you don't want to be running right behind somebody else. Um, otherwise, you actually need to distance yourself even further than six feet. So what they concluded is that if you're riding a bike, you want to be 65 feet away um, from the person riding directly in front of you, 33 feet away from the person running at about six um, minutes per mile, and 16 feet away when walking at normal pace. But um, as you probably saw after this article came out, there was a lot of um, controversy about it because they made um, assumptions that included um, no wind, so they didn't account for any headwind, tailwind, crosswinds. Um, they, didn't, they only looked at specific droplet sizes and they did not take into account any kind of virus infectivity or infectious dose needed. So I think the take home message from um, this is that basically you should allow for greater spacing if you're exercising outdoors, um, more than six feet if um, you're cycling or running, but whether or not there's specific number of how many feet, it still obviously depends on a lot of other factors like wind and all these other things that I mentioned. Clearly, if somebody is coughing or sneezing and exercising in a public area, you probably want to be further away or be sure that you're wearing an appropriate um, um, face covering for exercise. So in general, outdoor transmission of COVID is less, um, and that's based on several studies that the majority of cases of COVID transmission are happening indoors. However, please remember that in crowded outdoor settings, um, there can be transmission. So these there are a few other examples. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up soon. So parks prescriptions um, are another example of something that you could offer to patients because of the health benefits of being outdoor and in nature. Um, even, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, well, how do you sit on Zoom meetings all day with your patients and um, coworkers and research groups? Um, so I've had to be a little creative. We have an exercise bike at home and got a book stand. Um, so you can actually, I can sit on the bike and pedal during Zoom meetings. You know, so you could do your Zoom meetings while sitting on a yoga ball. You could get an under the desk cycle, um, try standing, putting your laptop on a counter. So there's ways to build in small movement breaks. Um, I'm gonna conclude with talking a little bit about <clears throat> some of the research that we're working on here. So consumer wearables are another way that people can track um, and motivate themselves to be active. Most of them can include step counters, um, looking at sedentary time, but they don't detect all activities. And so for instance, people, you know, if you're on a stationary bike or elliptical, or you're doing some of these home-based exercises I described, um, they actually have to manually log in most cases these activities. And there's also a lot of challenges that, you know, patients sometimes bring us these fitness devices and um, it results in a lot of physician data overload because we just don't want to look at all those numbers. We don't really know what to do with that at all. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on currently with computer science, um, Ubicomp Lab and Human Centered Design and Engineering is the Exercise RX app. Um, this is some of the rest of the team, but really it's actually a huge team um, of um, students that is also working on this project. 
So our goal with this project is to support physically inactive patients in sustainable behavior change, providing them personalized activity solutions and healthcare um, provider feedback. The idea is that eventually, and this has already been done in some other healthcare systems where they have allowed integration of wearable devices into their electronic health record, that physicians can start looking at step count and other um, physical activity metrics. Of course, we do not want to overload our inbox um, in Epic, which is already very overloaded with emails and messages, um, but that using um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, that we can actually come up with algorithms that help us to flag patients when they're having difficulties and identify ones that need more support um, that way and help with the clinical decision hooks that help guide physicians in what are the next steps once a patient runs into um, you know, a physical activity challenge. In conclusion for my lecture, um, Thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Um, I know that everybody on this call cares a lot about activity, and all of us must um, lead the way in helping ourselves, our patients, our families, and communities stay active through this um, and sharing the message that every movement counts. Um, you know, I think there's a lot that of unknown still in the data, but we do know from prior research that physical activity is absolutely central to immune function. Cardiorespiratory fitness is so important in preventing and managing chronic medical conditions, improving our mental wellness, social engagement, and that it's absolutely essential in building a resilience during this pandemic um, as we all try to get through this together. So in acknowledgments, I wanna thank um, the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, um, the Sports Institute, Yuba Comp Lab, and Human Centered Design and Engineering. I don't have a photo of everybody because obviously we all started doing um, Web, WebEx meetings before our whole team got assembled this spring. And these are some resources for um, your patients that may be helpful. Great, so I think we have some time for questions, Charles. Um, and everybody from the audience. So feel free to just jump in. <laughs>